Romans chapter 3. We're going to begin reading at verse 9. I'm going to be reading to verse 18. Hopefully, we're going to go further than that. I actually prepared all the way to the end of the chapter, but let's see how it goes, right? So Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? <laughs> Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. And so Paul begins by describing my board. No, actually, he... <laughs> Paul begins by describing humans in general, humanity in general. I want to develop this with you for a moment because... Paul is building a case for man's guilt, all of man, all humanity's guilt before God, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So up to this point, he has primarily argued from creation and conscience. He's also argued from logic and the law. And now, from Scripture, he is saying that both Jew and Gentile alike are guilty before God. Now, when he begins and he says, what then, are we better than they? Uh, are we better than what? Are we better than good yet sinful Gentiles? You know, when, when, when I use the term better than good, better than the good yet sinful Gentile, there is something in, uh, in just uh, the way we describe human nature and human behavior. There are those who are relatively good, meaning that we're not as evil. Not all people are as evil as they can be, but we are all evil. That's the point he's making. All we need to do is consider a little bit to consider the evil that has been done in society f throughout history. Evil has been done. And here's, here's the thing. A lot of people have a tendency, human nature being what it is, has a tendency of saying, well, evil has been done, but I've never done that kind of evil. But the question is, can I, can you, can we do that kind of evil? And the answer is, whatever a human being can do that is good, I can do. But whatever an evil, whatever a human being can do that is evil, I, it's possible I could do that too. Why? Because of my fallen nature. Prior to Christ, I have nothing restraining me. All I have is what is inside of me and what I desire, what I want. And so if I want something, I'm going to go after that, perhaps, if I really want it and all. And so evil is something that a man or a woman can pursue because sometimes evil is what they want. And so all humanity is under the perfection that God would demand of human beings. All humanity sins and falls short of that. We'll look at that in some detail in just a moment. And so are we better than they? Are we better than, than uh, good, relatively good, yet sinful Gentiles? The answer is no. Well, are we fundamentally better than the good, yet sinful Jewish person? And again, the answer is, is no. So he would be saying then am I saying that Christians have a better nature than Gentiles and Jews? Are believers saved because they're just better human beings? The answer is no, not at all. In terms of advantages, Jews had various blessings and privileges, obviously, but in terms of nature, they have no advantage. And so he says in verse 9, for we have previously charged both Jew and Greek that they are all under sin. And so, all are under sin. He now presents the fact that all humanity is sinful. And notice as he begins, and I'm going I'm to share something briefly, but move into this. I want you to see how he begins. Notice verse 10. As it is written. My wife, Marie, and I were having a conversation today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat some of it to you. It, it, it hopefully will make a bit of sense, but perhaps it won't. I don't know, but I'll share it. Marie and I were having a, a conversation, and I was sharing with her some things. And, and I'm trying to think of how to say it, because I want to say it quickly. I hope it makes sense. But I want you to notice it says, as it is written. I, I'm using that as my foundation for just a second. As it is written. 
What, what is he doing? He's putting the word of God in the center of the conversation. That's what he's doing. He's not using logic at this time. He's speaking of scripture as it is written. So Marie and I were having a, a visit today, and, and I don't mean this to be offensive to some who may think it is. But I said, I said, honey, I said, do you, do you remember? We both were raised in the Catholic Church. So I asked her a question. I said, do you remember the, the way the, uh, the, the architecture of the interior of, of the, the church building? So we were conversing about that. And I said to her this. I said, what is in the center? What was in the center of the Catholic Church? And so it's been a long time since, since we've been in Catholic Church together. And so... It took her a moment, and she said, the altar. I said, that's right. I said, the altar is in the center of the Catholic Church. How many of you were raised in the Catholic Church so I know? You know what I'm saying then, right? When you walked into the church, where was the, what was the center? When you walked in, the altar. Where was the pulpit? Well, in the churches I attended, they were usually off to the side. What's the center of the Catholic Church? I'm going to develop this for a second. What is it? It's the mass. It's the, what they call, the, the real term is the sacrifice of the mass. That's what it is. The center of the Catholic Church is the sacrifice of the mass. And so in the re, in the re killing, if you will, that Jesus dying once again, he becomes the bread in the Catholic Church and, and the wine becomes his blood. And all of that, it's, a, uh, it's, it's, a, it's more than simply symbolic in the Catholic Church. So the center is the sacrifice. That's why it's called the sacrifice of the Mass. That's what it's called, the sacrifice of the Mass, not just going to Mass. Every Catholic knows it's really called the sacrifice of the Mass. Why is it called that? Because there's a reenactment. Every Sunday, Jesus is re-crucified in the communion service. Maybe you remember, maybe you don't, but that's what it is. So we were conversing about that. And I said, what is the center of a Protestant church. You guys tell me, what is the center of the Protestant church? Do you know? Right here. This is the center. That's a major difference. The center of the Protestant church is the pulpit. Why the pulpit? Because the pulpit is also referred to as the holy altar or the place where the word of God is. God's word is the center of the church. That's why I wanted to speak for a second here because he says, as it is written. What is the center of our faith? God's word. Not any reenactments of anything that took place in the past, but a presentation of God's mind to his people. That's what Bible study is. Now here's something that some of you may not be interested in at all and others might say, oh, why do I stand here? Why don't I do this? I can do this, right? I can walk over here. I know what I'm going to say. I know what I plan on saying. I already looked at my notes. I can do this. I can walk around if I want to. I can talk to you. I'm very comfortable doing that. Why don't I do that? Because if I walk around while I'm teaching, I'm drawing your attention to me. I'm drawing your attention to me as I speak, what I'm doing. You're watching that right now. You're watching me move. Why do I stand here? So I don't distract. And today, many people want pastors who walk around, prowl the stage, entertain, grab people's attention, use humor and whatever else. They want that. They want to have conversation with him. But the pastor's responsibility is to say, it is written. That means... I stand here because I don't want to distract you by prowling a stage because after a while, what you're going to do is you're going to wait for me to do something. It just happens. That's human nature. And when I begin to think, oh, they're not really listening, I might say, you know, as, and then, you know, Jonah, and he went down, 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 and then I fall on the <laughs> ground. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I really believe that the center of all things should be the Word of God. I really do. And that's, that's why I stand here. That's why I don't move. 
You know, some people say, well, I want some animation. You know, I want, I want somebody to walk around. I want them to be alive. I want them to have personality and blah, blah, blah. But it's the word of God that's alive. And it's the word of God that makes you live. So I just wanted to speak about that because Mary and I were talking about that today. I said, you know, I said, it, 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 there are people today who see church as entertainment and, and the pastor as the actor, as the guy who draws the attention. He, he does all of that. And I've seen, man, I've been around for a long time. God knows that. And I've seen an awful lot of that. We want to keep Jesus Christ in his word center. And that's kind of how I wanted to begin this, by just reminding you of that. You know, just to remind you of that. Yeah, amen to that. So, as it, as it is written, there is none righteous. <laughs> no, not one. So what's he do? He appeals to Scripture as it is written. The Bible is the foundation for saying what he's about to say. Psalm 33, verse 4 says, The word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. So the word of the Lord is right and true. So as it is written, what does it say in Scripture? Well, there is none righteous, no, not one. No one has ever, outside of Christ, he's saying, been morally, perfectly righteous. Mankind, and he's about to say this, is universally sinful. There is none who is naturally holy. There is none who is naturally innocent. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. Now, I'm going to use a theological term a brief, briefly. Um, our Adamic nature, that's a theological term. Our Adamic nature is fallen. No one can do absolute good. So somebody says, well, what is the Adamic nature? How come you threw that on me? Because I want to show you how smart I am. No. <laughs> the Adamic nature, what is that? It's the propensity to sin that's been inherited from Adam. Why does man have an Adamic nature? Well, when Adam sinned and fell, the whole human family that followed was automatically polluted with a sinful nature and was born, Scripture says, with a corrupted heart. See, Romans 5.12 says, Just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22, as in Adam, all die. So also in Christ, all will be made alive. Galatians 3, 22, Scripture has concluded all under sin. And so he speaks concerning the propensity of the human being to sin due to the fallen nature, and the Bible declares that all have sinned. He says in verse 11, there's none who understands. In other words, no one has innate ability to comprehend what is spiritually true. We don't have that capacity. In 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, Paul said, The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. When he says the natural man, that's the unspiritual man, that's a man who's not born again. The natural man cannot receive. That word receive in the original language means to welcome. So the unspiritual man does not welcome the things of the Spirit of God. So when it says the natural man will not receive, he will not welcome in, it's a picture of someone knocking at your door, you looking out the window and seeing who it is, and you don't want to open it. So you're not welcoming that person in. Well, the natural man doesn't receive. God will say, pictured his word, God, his, his word is, is knocking on a door, will say, but they will not welcome it in. They don't want to receive it. Why is that? Because these things are spiritually discerned. What they are, he says, is their foolishness to him. That word foolish is the root that, in the Greek, where we can find the word moronic or imbecilic. The natural man does not welcome in the things of the Spirit of God because it's imbecilic. It makes no sense to him. You know this to be true prior to coming to Christ. Someone would share about Jesus with you, and you'd say, that makes no sense. That's We didn't welcome it in. It takes the Holy Spirit to convict us. So the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness to him, neither can he know them. He cannot understand or discern them. Why? Because they're spiritually discerned. So why do people reject the Scriptures? Why do they reject God? Because it makes no sense to them. 
That's why Jesus said that the Holy Spirit would convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Because it takes the Spirit of God to take you, to take me, and to redirect my attention to Him. When my children were very, very small, when they were babies, and uh, I would be wanting to talk to them on occasion, their little attention span being what it was, they'd kind of look around the room when Daddy's talking to them. And I used to redirect their attention. I would gently touch their little faces, and I would move it towards me so I would look eye to eye with them. And I would say, Daddy's talking to you. No, I didn't do that. <laughs> Daddy's talking to you. <laughs> you need to listen. You redirect the attention. The Holy Spirit redirects your attention. You're thinking of different things, but the Holy Spirit grabs hold of you. He brings conviction, and now you listen. You may not hear every word that was said, but now you're listening to these words. And as you hear those words, he convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He awakens you. That's how you got saved. And so there's none who is any good. There's none who understands. They don't spiritually comprehend. Verse 11, he continues, there's none who seeks, seeks God. When it says there's none who seeks God, it carries the connotation of there's none who seek an after him to know him and know his will. In Psalm 14, verse 2, the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men. And that carries the connotation, by the way, of investigating to see if there were any that did understand, if there's any that seek God. And the answer to that is no. You might find this interesting. Every man-made religion avoids God instead of seeking him. Well, how's that? Oh, no, wait a minute. There's guys who do all kinds of crazy things because they want to know God. How can you say that? Well, that's because man's religion is normally based on human effort. And in your human effort, whether it's in your fasting or your prayers or whether it's in your generous giving, whether it's in your meditation, whether it's in your fasting, whatever it may be, it's all human effort. You're attempting to breach the gulf between a holy God and a sinful person. And you're trying to do it through your own efforts. So there's none who seeks after God, really, because every man-made religion avoids him. Man's religion is normally based on human effort. It's interesting, but someone once said this. God is the number one seeker in the Bible. We like to speak about how we seek after him, but we forget that he is the one who first seeks after us. When Adam fell, was it Adam chasing after God in the garden? No, it was the voice of the Lord. Adam heard, calling out, Adam, where are you? It was not Adam. The Bible doesn't say Adam was saying, oh, where are you, God? No, the Bible says Adam hid himself. And it was God, the seeking God, who went after Adam. You see that very clearly in the ministry of Jesus. He is the one who seeks after the lost sheep. He's the one who seeks after the lost coin. And he's the one who seeks after the lost son in the story of the prodigal. None of them are seeking after him. He is seeking after them. And so God is the one who sought after us. Now, when Isaiah prophesied about Messiah, he said in Isaiah 53, 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we have all gone astray. Verse 12 says they've all turned aside. When it says they've turned aside, that means they've gone out of the way. They've gone in the wrong direction. Humanity, Paul is saying, has left the true path of pursuing God in his will. This is, a, is from Psalm 14.3. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There's none who does good. No, not one. They have all together become... <coughs> Excuse me, I've got this cough coming. Don't get near me. I'll give you COVID. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm not going to. It, it, it's a picture in verse 12 of turning aside, going in the wrong direction, and together, he's speaking of humanity, have become unprofitable. Again, there's none who does good. No, not one. Uh, humanity left that path. Notice it says they become unprofitable. That word unprofitable is putrid. That's an ugly word. The picture is they become sour. They become putrid like sour milk is what he's saying. So all humanity 
as fallen to ruin. And the point he's making is man without God doesn't produce righteous works. That's why verse 12 says, there's none who does good. No, not one. There's none who is morally upright. Their throat, verse 13, and I've got this cough that's wanting to fight me. <sighs> you win. Um, their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues, they've pre practiced deceit. This is an interesting phrase here. Let me share this with you. He says their throat is an open tomb. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Their throat is an open grave. Well, what does that mean? Their speech is not only corrupt, but it corrupts others. I remembered something, and I looked it up, and I quote, I'm going to just quote it. The point he's making is death proceeds from them, from their mouth. Their words do not bring life. That's his point. But when it says their throat is an open grave, I remembered something, and I'll just read it to you. The Romans sometimes compelled a captive, listen to this, to be joined face to face with a dead body and to bear it about until the horrible decaying body fluids destroyed the life of the living victim. The poet Virgil describes this cruel punishment. The living and the dead at his command were coupled face to face and hand to hand till choked with stench in loathed embraces tied, the lingering wretches pined away and died. And so, your words, he's saying, without God. This humanity without Christ is like the stench of an open grave. It's putrid. So, the one who is spiritually dead can't speak spiritual life. They're like an unsealed sepulcher. Stench and death are present. That's pretty strong language. He says, with their tongues... They have practiced deceit. When it says practice deceit, they're smooth liars. The first time you lied, and everyone in this room has lied, I know someone may say, well, I, I haven't. That's your first lie. <laughs> We've all lied. But the first lie you, 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 you lied, you probably got caught because it probably just wasn't convincing. But you practiced, and after practicing, you can get pretty good at lying. It's, a, it's something you can craft. You can learn to be a good liar. When I gave my um, cardboard testimony, those of you who saw it, I don't know, but um, the first thing I put, and there was a reason for it, was I was a thief. Why did I say that? If you're not interested, I'll tell you anyway. The reason I said thief is because the first thing I knew I did is I stole something. So I started out as a thief. But then I tried to cover it up. So the second thing is I became a liar. That's why I put thief and liar. I wasn't lying before I stole. I stole and learned to lie. And if you practice long enough, you can become very convincing. And that's what he's saying. These are very convincing liars because they practice. They sm they're smooth liars. And a person's character is revealed by the way they speak. In verse 13, the poison of asps. The word asp is a snake, it's a cobra. The poison of cobras is under their lips. The poison in a cobra is in a bag, and um, it's under a tooth that discharges venom. So that's a picture he's giving. But it's a point. Well, when the unsaved preach, there's danger because their words, he's saying, are spiritual poison. Now you say, well, that's an interesting thing. Well, Jesus said this when some of the Pharisees were having a, having, uh, making accusations against him. You remember they called him Beelzebub, prince of the flies. And Jesus spoke, and he said to them this in Matthew 12, 34. He said, brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying that the poison of cobras is under the lips. You brood of vipers. You cannot bring forth good things. That's what Paul is saying. Verse 14, whose mouth is full of cursing and 
bitterness, whose mouth is full of reproaching people, and bitterness speaks of them being cruel the way they speak. They only desire, in other words, the worst for people. They have bitterness. What is bitterness? It's openly expressed emotional hostility. They use their speech to hurt people. Proverbs 12, 18, there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. There are people who have learned how to use their words to just lacerate people. And it's coming out of, out of an evil heart towards people. That's where it's coming from. And Paul, once again, is saying this is the behavior. And he's not saying this is the behavior of believers. He's saying this is the behavior of humanity, humanity that doesn't know God. He says in verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. 16, destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. And so their feet are swift. They're eager to commit sin. They leave devastation in their wake. Why? Well, they're violent and they're angry. This kind of behavior becomes commonplace. It's become commonplace in our day. This anger, this this violence that has become normal in just the last few years. It's amazing to me, you know, that, that people are not only, only um, rude to one another, but sometimes they are physically abusive. I was watching the news. If you watch the news at all, perhaps you saw this recently, a swimmer named Riley something or other, um, for some reason, her, her name escaped me. But anyway, she's a swimmer, and she was lecturing on, on the need to maintain women as women swimmers. I think there's a logic to that. That makes sense to me. Women should compete with women, and just because a man says, I feel like a woman, doesn't mean that he is a woman, right? I mean, I used to almost tease. I teased about that. I'll say this quickly. I teased about that years ago. Some of you may have been around when... I was teaching, and I said something like this. I said, you know, I can say that I'm a six-foot-four Swedish man with blue eyes and blonde hair. Yeah, you laugh, right? <laughs> I can say that, and that was my point. You're looking at somebody who's not that. Is that still true today? No. Because you're not allowed to doubt what somebody has said. Their self-delusion is more important than reality. We're living in that right now. Maybe you haven't noticed it, but we are. There are laws being passed right now that are forbidding you from pointing that out. Right now. Right now. Here in California and various other places. And so that's taking place even as I'm speaking. And so there are people who um, get angry at you because you don't agree with them. And so this young woman was given a lecture up in San Francisco in a university, and people who refer to themselves as transgender began to attack her, swear at her, they hit her, and there's nothing being said about that. There's nothing being said about that other than, and I have to say it this way, other than the spokeswoman for, um, for the president said that they are solidly united behind those people who or of the persuasion to hit people for that. She didn't say it that way, but that's what she's basically saying. We're living in that time right now. We have to be aware of this. And by the way, we can't roll over and be quiet about it. We have to be open about it. This is wrong. This is not something right. And the church of all entities on the face of the earth, we're supposed to speak the truth in love, but speak it nonetheless, right? So that's taking place right now. But that's a sign of the last days. 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, Paul said it like this. He said, know this, that in the last days, perilous or dangerous times will come. And he began to describe those days. And in verse 3, he said that they'd be unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. We're living in those days. In verse 17, the way of peace they have not known. They have not sought the peace of God, and they have not sought peace with God. And as a result, they have no peace and they're unfamiliar with what it truly is. He's saying that they haven't opened to God's way for peace. And Isaiah 57, 21 says it like this, there's no peace, saith my God, for the wicked. 
So being at war with God, they have refused the peace that's been offered to them, all humanity, because the peace that's being offered is found in what is called the gospel of reconciliation. Now, the gospel of reconciliation is a, is a message. The gospel message is a message that calls for unconditional surrender. I don't know if you know that. 2 Corinthians 5, you can research it, study it. You'll see it very plainly presented. We have been entrusted with what is called the gospel of reconciliation to what God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. And so the gospel of reconciliation has also been referred to as terms of peace. Now, the terms of peace that are offered in the gospel of reconciliation are not a conditional peace. You know, it is calling for unconditional surrender. In other words, you can't negotiate peace with God and retain the sins that he's at war with. You have to unconditionally surrender. That's what you did when you got saved. You didn't say, I hope you didn't say, Jesus, I'm going to give you all of these things, but I want to keep this for myself because it's just a small sin. It's not, a, it's not that bad. Just this small one I want to keep. No, you unconditionally said, I give up. I surrender. You're the victor. I have been vanquished. I want peace with you. When the United States fought and participated in the war, in the Second World War, and MacArthur, I believe it was MacArthur, went to, on the Missouri, if I'm not mistaken at the moment, and received the um, sword of Hirohito, it was an unconditional surrender. We did not negotiate a partial peace. It was full surrender. That's what happened to conclude World War II. That's a picture of what God did through Christ. The gospel doesn't say, stay doing these sins, it's okay. You'll outgrow them. The gospel says, you're at war with God. You are in hostile opposition. If he says it's black, you say it's white. If he says it's sour, you say it's sweet. If he, if he says it's up, you say it's down. You're having a war with God. That's what the, the Bible teaches. We're at war with him. But Jesus dies on a cross and defeats the enemy, then offers through his message terms of peace with you. But you don't negotiate with him by saying, I'm going to keep these sins because they're small sins, they're pet sins, I've had them all my life, they're really part of my just the way I am, you know. No, you said, I, I give them all to you. I unconditionally surrender to you. I ask for full forgiveness because I fully surrender. That's, that's what Paul's talking about. And the world hasn't done that. He's saying the world rejects those things and therefore they have no peace because they don't have peace with God. He says, basically, that the reason they have no peace is because they have no fear of God. Now, Matthew Henry said this. He said, the root of religion is the fear of God reigning in the heart. And in Proverbs 14, 27, it says, the fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. In verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So he has just finished from verse 9 to verse 18, condemning all humanity under sin. But in verse 19, he makes it clear, whatever the law, speaking of the law of Moses says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped. And so he's closing the door on all humanity by saying that all stand guilty before God. And what he's saying is this, you cannot be saved if you try to keep the law. You stand condemned, he's saying, in the law of Moses. That's why we need God's grace. And that includes the person who has an internal moral code, and that includes the Jewish person who had a written code. We break the, the code, whether it's internal or written. And so those who've received the written code, he's saying, speaking of the Jews, stand guilty before the Lord. And because all people violate standards, all stand guilty before God. Therefore, verse 20, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. Even if we try very hard to be good, 
we fall short of God's glory. The law of Moses reveals to us what sin is. It also reveals our guilt before God. Later on in chapter 7, let's see, we're in chapter 3, so in about a year, when we get to chapter 7, verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. Indeed, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, do not covet. So the law actually condemns. It doesn't save. The law reveals to us how far we have fallen short of God's standards. The law actually defines for us, reveals what sin is. It reveals how we have broken the law. And then it even sentences us. And unless God had done this for us, given Christ, we'd never realize our guilt before him. So no matter how good we are compared to other people, we still fall short. Everybody has a friend that they have in their past or even now that's worse than them. And so you can kind of point to him and say, at least I'm not like that, you know. We all have that. So no matter how good we are compared to somebody else, we're still not perfect. Isaiah 64, 6, we are all as an unclean thing. All our, un all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all do fade as a leaf. Our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. We are an unclean thing. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The leper who had oozing sores would wrap their arm with a cloth. And the cloth would become polluted by the seepage. And just in life, as walking in, in life, the dust would settle. It would become dirty and grimy. And Isaiah is simply saying, our righteousness is like a filthy rag. We may consider it ourselves to be clean, but in fact, we're filthy. We need the Lord. That's why we're thankful for the grace of God, because grace changes everything. In Titus 3, verses 4 through 7, when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. I'm going to stop there by just magnifying the grace of God. Thank God for his grace. No matter how hard I tried, no matter how hard you tried to be good, the desire was within me, the ability to perform that which I desired was not. I didn't want to be a liar, but I was. Just this last Sunday on Easter service, a little boy approached me, sweetest little guy. I'd say he's nine or ten maybe. And I was in the back and... I think it was Jared came and knocked on the door and said, Pastor David, there's a little boy out there who wants to talk to you for a minute. Would you come out? And I said, no, get the kid out of here. No. <laughs> no, I said, of course. So I came walking out, and he was just standing there. Sweet as, he's a sweet little guy, maybe 10 or so. And he's standing there. And he's just wanting to, to talk, and he's jabbering and this and that. His mama's doing what mamas do, apologizing. You know, well, I'm sorry. And I thought, oh, no, I enjoy this. I love this. I mean, this is great. I enjoy talking to these little guys. Little guys. And so we're having a nice conversation. But then the mama says this to me. She says, you know, he kind of exaggerates. No, he's a liar. <laughs> she says he, he lies. And, you know, Pastor, maybe you can pray for him and help him a little bit, but... He, he's, he makes up a lot of stuff. Well, they'd already told me some of their story, and I could understand why he does that. So I looked at him, and I told him this, and I'll close with this little illustration, but this is what I told this little boy. I said, I understand why you lie. I understand why you don't tell everything exactly. I didn't call him a liar. Uh, stupid. No, I, I, I <laughs> unrighteous rags. No, I said, um, I said, I know, I understand why you exaggerate the truth. 
I said, I used to do that. I, I, I was a liar, a polished liar. I would actually sit down at the age of 17 and 18. I wasn't a child. And I would make up something to tell somebody. And I used to do it habitually. I was a liar. Oh, I'd make up stories that I did and make their eyes get wide and say, well, you did that? And i go, yeah, I did this and I did that. And I used to formulate lies. And I was telling this boy, this little guy, I said, you know, I used to lie. And he goes, you did, Pastor? I said, yeah, I, I did. I said, I understand. I said, but let me tell you something. I found out why I lied. The reason I lied is because I just didn't know my value before God. I didn't realize that, that God loved me. So I tried to make myself into something I wasn't. I wanted to recreate myself. He said, so I tell lies about what I did and how adventurous I was and all of those things. I said, and then one day the Lord just told me, you know, I love you and, and I, you don't need to make up stories. Just be yourself. And maybe that ministers to somebody even listening to this now. You know, who you are in Christ is more than enough. Is more than enough. You, you don't have to be the hero of your own stories. You don't have to be the one who never loses. You don't have to be the person who is just, oh, so Ed, just be yourself. Just be who you are. You know, and one last closing thought, something that may help somebody, may not, but on this whole thing about God's grace and goodness. Uh, when I was a young man and I would date girls, I would ask them, and I didn't date very often. I was too cheap to. But when I did, I would, now where do you want to go? What do you want to do? What do you like to eat? What kind of music? I'd kind of sound them out. What kind of food do you like? Oh, I like it. <laughs> Me too. What, what kind of music do you like? I like country. <laughs> Me too. <sighs> oh. Um, that one hurt. Um, and then one day I met a girl named Marie. And at that point I said, I'm not going to try and do everything she likes. I'm going to take her to see if she likes the things I like. So when I asked her out, I'd say, would you like to go with me? I'm going. And guess what? She wanted to go. Would you like to go here? This is where I'm going. So no, I didn't cater. I didn't pretend I was somebody else. I was myself. And guess what? She fell in love with the real person. She fell in love with the real person. That's how it works. And so as I was sharing with this little fellow, you don't have to say things to make yourself what you're not. Just learn that God loves you, and he can make you into what he wants because of the grace of God. Because God's grace changes everything. So the law, our conscience, creation, our morals, all of those things fall short. The only thing that matters is God's grace. That's what Paul's pointing out. All sin and fall short of the glory of God. That's why God sent Jesus. Because you cannot make it on your own. You needed his help. That's why we need a savior. As he did what I can't do. And all I need to do is trust and believe that he can give me what he prepared for me. I didn't do it. He did it. I just received it. And guess what? It changes your life. We'll see that more deeply next time we get together.